Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 13, looking at verses 31 to 35. While you're turning there, let me say, first of all, how much I appreciate your prayers for our family. Uh, the Lord was honored uh, this past uh, week ago, Saturday, uh, in the uh, memorial service of my sister. She was 83 years old. She uh, had been on dialysis for four years. Uh, she fought the good fight. Uh, she finished the course. She kept the faith. We were able to celebrate through tears that all the pain that has accumulated in her body uh, in these recent years. She, had a, she fractured her back somehow every time she moved, in excruciating pain. They couldn't do surgery. All that's gone. She's with the Lord. And so we appreciate you praying for us. Continue to pray for my two nephews, her sons, and their families. Uh, there's, even though she only had two sons, there's quite an extension from that. She was a mother of two, grandmother of many, great-grandmother of many more, and, and a great-great-grandmother. Quite a legacy that she left behind. And, and many of those are not converted. So as you pray for our family, pray that God would use the gospel that was preached to them. Many of them won't be setting foot inside a church house unless the Lord moves upon them. And uh, pray that the gospel that was preached would find root and save them. That was her desire uh, as she was slipping into eternity. I also want to say thank you to Brother Norman Hare who, uh, who preached in my absence. He's so faithful, uh, so studied, and God always blesses that time. And I know you were blessed, and it's a, it's a blessing. We're going to be studying about one another. What a blessing uh, you showed to us. Uh, brother, you did that to me. So I thank the Lord for, for Joe Ramey who stepped up and led the worship time last week, and Joyce Morgan, who accompanied him. We appreciate all those kind of expressions. Uh, and Karen wanted me to say thanks to those who covered her. I joke sometimes, when the day comes that the Lord takes me away from here, I don't know when that will be, how that will be. Uh, it will be sad, but people will weep uh, like Rachel uncontrollably to try to fill Karen's place. I can be filled. I can be recovered. But it takes several people anytime she's out, uh, to take care of her. So thank you for those who did that as well. I have a sheet that I have printed out. It's the one another's in the New Testament. Uh, it's one sheet, front and back. And I want these, someone help my brother Norman pass these out. I think I've, I know I've got at, at least one for each family, maybe one for each adult. Uh, just my suggestion would be to take this and just uh, fold it Put it in your Bible, and you'll have uh, a pretty, pretty comprehensive list. Uh, and this, if you may not have looked at this, so this may kind of surprise you at all of the uh, demonstrations, all of the uses of this term one another in the New Testament. Now, John 13. 31 to 35. Stand with me if you would and follow along as I read these verses. The, the series we're launching into that we'll be in for a while is one another life in a gospel community. Anybody can have a religious organization. Anybody can have something they call a church. Church of Satan uh, got recognized this past year uh, with their 501c3 status. You can even identify as a Christian church. But a gospel community. That's what Jesus was building when he said, on this rock I will build my church. So follow along as I read these verses. Jesus has, if you remember, has washed the feet of his disciples. He has told them, one of you at table with me will betray me. And Judas leaves the room. And our text says, when he had gone out, that is Judas, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him 
in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What if we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the Lord take us through this study. It's not going to be a typical study for us. We're not going line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse through a book. We're going to be moving around the New Testament, collecting, encountering, being encountered by these expressions, most of which are in the command form, their commands. We're going to have to respond. Are we going to take seriously the call to be one anothering one another? Or are we going to dismiss it? My prayer is, as we go through this study, that there will grow within us. It's already there. Grow in intensity and expression like wildfire. A one anothering climate which is both precious, powerful, and compelling to a watching world. Thank you. Please be seated. I want to read to you a couple of their brief articles. One is from Paul David Tripp, speaking to this matter of community. Uh, the other is from Burke Parsons, in a similar fashion. Listen to this. Life in this fallen world is hard. That's why you need a community of love. One of the themes that courses through the New Testament and is a repeated theme of this devotional is that you, you walk with God, your walk with God is designed by God to be a community project. Anonymous, consumerist, isolated, independent, self-sufficient, Jesus and me, Christianity is a distant and distorted facsimile of the faith of the New Testament. You and I simply were not created to be alone. It is not good that the man should be alone. Genesis opens with that. Or recreated in Christ Jesus to be alone. 1 Corinthians 12, 14, we finished studying, says, The body does not consist of one member but of many. We were not created nor were we redeemed to be alone. The biblical word pictures of temple, stones joined together to be a place where God dwells, and body, each member dependent upon the function of the other, decimate any idea that, the healthy, that healthy Christianity can live outside of essential community. Yet many, many professing believers live their lives with a huge separation between their public church personas and the details of their private existence. We're skilled at brief, non-personal conversations about the weather, sports, politics. We're lear learned at giving either non-answers or spiritually platitudinous answers to people's questions. We live in long-term networks of terminally casual relationships. No one really knows us beneath the well-crafted public display. And because they don't know us, they cannot minister to us. Because no one can minister to that which he does not know. Moreover, we think we know ourselves and we think we're okay, forgetting the blinding power of sin. That's why church is, for many of us, nothing more than a thing to attend on Sunday. Church is a formal set of activities. Church is a buffet of regularly scheduled, demographically designed religious offerings. Church is a place where music can be enjoyed and sermons can be heard. Church is what connects us to worldwide missions. Church provides wholesome activities for our children. But church isn't an interdependent, webbed together community of personally focused love and grace for us all. That's not how it's viewed by many. But the Bible's clear. 
When each part is working properly, the body of Christ grows to maturity in Christ. So says Ephesians 4. We each need to live in intentional, intentionally intrusive, Christ-centered, grace-driven, redemptive community. This community is meant to enlighten and protect. It's meant to motivate and encourage. It's meant to rescue and restore. It's meant to instill hope and courage. It's meant to confront and rebuke. It's meant to guide and protect. It's meant to give vision and sound warning. It's meant to incarnate the love and grace of Jesus when you feel discouraged and alone. It's meant to be a visible representation of the grace of Jesus that is your hope. It's not a luxury. It's a spiritual necessity. The question is, are you webbed in? That's Paul David Tripp. Burke Parsons talks about the, what he calls, the, or Francis Schaeffer called the orthodoxy of community. The love language of all marriages is self-denial. When both a husband and wife are consumed, not with their own immediate happiness, but with the happiness of, of one another, they will enjoy a happy marriage. Surely we've learned this in the study on Sunday nights, perhaps in a new and fresh and more intense way. We will finish that study tonight, session 10 on love and respect. Parsons says, though the same is true for enduring friendships and for authentic community. With the disintegration of marriage has come the disillusion of community. As such, community has fallen on hard times. What every generation and every society in all of history has enjoyed, that is recognizing the blessedness of community, the rising generation will have to fight for. With the rise of online communities, online church, and online everything, face-to-face, eye-to-eye, shoulder-to-shoulder community has become increasingly difficult to find. Karen and I were walking in our community some time back. It was dark. We passed one of the little parks in our, in our neighborhood, and there sitting on a bench were six teenagers. You say, well, Brother Bill, you said it was dark. How would you know there were six teenagers there? Because every one of them had a phone with their face buried in it, not one of them speaking to each other, and so their faces were glowing. Now, it had been wonderful if they were beaming with community, but they weren't beaming with community. They were reflecting the light of their digital devices. We're going to have to fight for community. In a day when when children and adults would rather bury their heads in something to read what someone says, to say something to someone else, than to interact with one another. So we don't know what real community is and don't know what to look for. Real community doesn't happen on its own. It takes time, patience, repentance, forgiveness, and love that covers a multitude of one another's sins. The church community is not just a crowd of people on a Sunday morning. It's the gathered, worshiping people of God in a congregation where masks aren't needed and where real friends help bear the real burdens of one another. Community is not just getting together. It is living together, suffering together, rejoicing together, and dying together. Although many Christians claim to want genuine community, many want it only on their own terms, when it's convenient when it demands nothing from them, when they, what they want isn't the church community, but a country club where they pay their dues for services rendered. They want to be served without having to serve anyone else. Real community forces us to die to ourselves and get over ourselves so that we might love one another as ourselves. The great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all of your being and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Francis Schaeffer observed that the early church practiced two things simultaneously, orthodoxy of doctrine and orthodoxy of visible community. Such orthodoxy of visible community is grounded in the one another passages of Scripture, which provide us with the essential elements of authentic community. They strike at the root of our self-centeredness, and they lead us to take our eyes off ourselves and to deny ourselves 
so that we might love one another, encourage one another, confess our sins to one another, forgive one another, not slander one another, not gossip about one another, not devour one another, not envy one another. In so doing, our Father in heaven is glorified as we manifest the beauty of the gospel of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit who has united a bunch of repentant sinners like us. Life in a gospel community. When I first arrived here 14 years ago, I remember talking to one of the members. He was not, he was not a fringe member. He was right in the center of the ministry. And said to me back when we had several hundred sitting here, he said, I sit over here. I don't even know the people over there. I don't know what he thought he was saying to me. But I took it as tragic. Tragic. I want us to begin the study today, and this is just an introduction to it. We'll probably be coming back to this passage at some point because the idea of loving one another is what drives this whole uh, discussion about the one another's. They're all predicated upon loving one another. But I want us to see in these few verses today, first of all, the glory of God displayed in the cross, and secondly, the glory of God displayed in a one another, one anothering gospel community. Look at these first verses, verses 31 to 33. Jesus, remember, he's just washed their feet. He's just warned them what somebody's going to betray him. Judas leaves to go out to do that very thing. Jesus looks at those who remain. And he talks about his impending glorification. Now, if you don't know what's happening here, these verses will sound like Russian to you. When he, that is Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. What's happening there? Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he says, God will be glorified in my death. Now, brothers and sisters, if he had said, coming out of the waters of baptism at the Jordan, now the Son of Man is glorified, we would have said, wow, that's, I see, is that true? <laughs> the Father speaks from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, the Spirit the in the form of a dove? Yes. He didn't say that then. If he had on the Mount of Transfiguration, not much time removed from this episode here, said when Moses and Elijah came to talk with him about it, the, I love the Greek in this, says they discussed with him his echodos. If you and I looked at it, the 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 Greek letter, the chi, that makes the k sound, looks like an X. His exodus. Just as Moses had an exodus, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, just as Elijah had a tremendous exodus when he was taken up in a chariot of fire, Jesus was about to have an exodus. He was going to, to lead captivity captive. He was going to bring many sons to glory. So there they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And if he had said at that point, now is the Son of Man glorified, we would have understood it. But no, he didn't say it then. He said it staring the painful, shameful, humiliating death of the cross in the face. He had taught them that when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. His glorification was going to come through much pain, much sacrifice. And he says, the Father 
God is glorified in him. Him doing that would glorify God. If we ask our children, who made you? God made me. What else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. Joanna was catechizing Aggie the other day. Aggie's two years old. She's a little precocious. Who made you, she asked her. God. What else did God make? Cupcakes. Why did God make you in all things? He was hungry. So they've got a ways to go there. But they'll get there. They'll get there. Why did God make you in all things? To glorify him. Why did God send Jesus from the splendor of heaven to the dusty earth to glorify him? And so he speaks of glory here. And he goes on and says, if God is glorified in him, that is in the Son of Man, God will also glorify him in himself. He is stating again what he has said in the previous verse. And then he adds this. And commentators think that he has shifted at this point from speaking of the specter of the cross to the glory of the resurrection and glorify him at once when he would rise from the grave. And then he says something that's the only thing in the Gospels that he uses this term. And John the Apostle picks up on this in his, in his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Little children. He never used that while Judas was present. But when Judas leaves the room, little children, Yet a little while, I'm with you, just for a little while longer. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I'm talking about going to the cross. You can't do for yourself and you can't do for others what I'm about to do for you. And it's in that setting, the glory of God displayed in the cross and really in the resurrection as well, that he then speaks to them of the glory of God displayed in a one-anothering gospel community. Where I'm going, you cannot come. And he moves from that, basically to say to them, but here's what you can do. Here's what you must do. Here's what you will do. Because he says later in John 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. This is a command. This is in the imperative mood. It's not a suggestion. It'll be helpful. Things will be more peaceful. There'll be less controversy. It may, it may give us a good reputation. None of that. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. The Shema in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? It was a trick. They were hoping he would choose one of the ten and they would say, well, you mean, you mean that's more important than number such and such? It was a lawyer trying to trip him up. He said, the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, citing the Shema. And the second is like unto it. In other words, you can't, you can't split them up. 
By the way, if you know the Ten Commandments, you know you can't split them up either. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as your... So they were taught to God, love to one another, love for ourselves. There's a place for that. It's not the first place. If you make love to God the first place, then, then love for yourself looks like, as Jonathan Edwards would teach, doing that which is most calculated to your best self-interest. And that which is most calculated to your best self-interest is to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, Edwards would say, Calvin said, you murder yourself, you break the sixth commandment if you live and die on this earth and allow yourself to spend eternity in hell. You have murdered yourself. Edward said that which is calculated to your best self-interest is to seek the face of God and come to know his mercy and salvation. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do good to your neighbor. Do good to yourself. We live in a day where it's all about doing good for me, no matter what it costs everyone else. That is totally antagonistic to community. Jesus, though, says, I'm giving you a new commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. I submit to you, the bar is raised significantly. You say, well, didn't Jesus believe that you're to love God supremely? Well, certainly he did. He cited that to the lawyer. And in chapter 15, he'll say, if you love me, you'll obey me. So here's the, here's the horns of the dilemma, as it were. That's why Paul Tripp said, Jesus, this Jesus and me mentality is a far cry from biblical Christianity. If you love me, you'll obey me. He goes on and says, I think it's in John 14, he who has my commandments, He's not talking about a Pharisee wearing them on a phylactery with a little box over his doorpost. He who has, the word has, holds the idea of treasuring. He who, he who knows my commandments and values them, treasures them, prays, dear God, inculcate this into me. Take it off the pages of my Bible and work it into my mind that I remember it. Drive it into my heart that I'm a doer of the Word. He who has my commandments and keeps them, He is the one who loves me. And He will be loved by my Father. Yes, with the technology we have, you could take a good Bible program and you could find every imperative verb used by Jesus in the Gospels and then those cited in the epistles, in the letters attributed to Jesus, and you would have the commands of Jesus. It's not a bad thing to do, by the way. It would be a good study. But clearly... In the context of what we're looking at today, pulsating behind John 14, 21 and John 15 is love one another. How? Just as 1 Corinthians 13 taught us that we don't get to decide what love looks like toward another person. Jesus says, you want to love others? Stop, and as, as, you're, as you're the hymn, you know, count your many blessings, see what God has done. Count the ways I love you. And that's my commandment to you. Just as I have loved you, 
you also are to love one another. The creator of the universe had just washed the dirty, stinking feet of his disciples. I told you when we studied through John 13 some time ago that in the pecking order of the, of the home in the first century, a Jewish home, be true in a Gentile home, that as they were adding servants and slaves to their household, one of the lowest, one of the lowliest things you could do would be assigned, you're the guy that washes people's feet when they come in off the road because there's no telling what they have stepped in. And you get to wash their feet. And Jesus stooped down in John 13 and washed their feet. And with that fresh on their minds, having come into the room with dirty feet, now sitting listening to him, and they have clean feet, and he says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. He had said earlier in John 13, you call me master and Lord, and you speak truly because that's who I am. And if I, your master and Lord, have washed your feet, how much more should you wash one another's feet? The argument there is not about podiatrist hygiene. It's the, it's the argument from the... From the if, 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 you, if you will do this, then surely anything less than this would not be as difficult as challenging. That's the argument there. So the one another's, which litter the New Testament, permeate the New Testament, are predicated upon who Jesus is, what he came to do, what he modeled, what he taught, what he commanded. And you and I cannot be the disciples he's called us to be if we are not willing to get our hands dirty with one another. It's impossible. You also are to love one another. And then he says this. It's amazing how we miss things. Think of all the training. Think of all the printing. Think of all the planning. Think of all the calendaring. Think of all the energy. Think of all the organizing. Think of all the gathering that has taken place through the centuries to get Christians into a better position to be an evangelistic community. I can't even count on one hand and, and finish the list of all the evangelistic training and seminars I have been in number one, and have taught number two. By this, verse 35, all people will know that you are my disciples. Jesus, what can we do uh, to get people's attention, first of all, and then to show them, demonstrate, tell them, convince them that we are followers of Jesus, the Messiah, the crucified, risen, ascended, soon returning King. We can ask them diagnostic questions. That has its place. But basically Jesus is saying here, nothing can take the place of loving one another. 
Now, about this, I'm not suggesting here, don't let the devil lie to you. I'm not suggesting here that we do not love one another. I just said a while ago, you do, and you loved on us. As we had to be away, you, you showed love for one another, for us. And we do that with one another continually. But what I am challenging you in this study is that if we would take this head on and let this tackle us and let uh, this pin us to the ground and let this teach us and change us and transform us, I happen to believe that we live in a world, we live in a community as as, as great a city as Owasso is. There are people hurting here. There are people dying here. There are people disconnected here. There are people who feel disjointed. They don't feel like anybody loves them. They don't feel like there's a place for them. And if we get more seriously intentional to let this wash over us and change us and realize that that church is not about a Sunday meeting. It's about life in a community. That's a very compelling witness. People will come just in the, in the faint hope, in the off chance that they might find somebody who will take them for who they are. Somebody who will love them and not reject them, not point out their flaws, their failures. I believe that, brothers and sisters. And if you will believe that with me, I don't think we begin to calculate or anticipate or understand or even be prepared for people who will want to be a part of a family of faith whose dominant feature is loving one another. One writer said that Jesus uses this, guy, this picture here 16 times in the Gospels. If there are 58 or 59 occurrences of the notion of loving one another, this clearly dominates it. This clearly dominates it. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What does that look like? I'm glad you asked that. There's a sheet here. Look at it. Be at peace with one another. If you love one another, you will hate conflict. You will, you will, you will take a knife to your tongue to do anything you can to keep from is disrupting peace. You'll wash one another's feet. That is, you'll serve one another. Nothing will be beneath you in the life of the body of Christ. You'll love one another, obviously. You'll outdo one another in showing honor. You will live in harmony with one another. You will be welcoming toward one another. You will be willing to instruct one another. Do you, do you believe this? Every one of you here who's a blood-bought child of Jesus Christ has something to teach us. We make up, according to, to uh, Paul in Ephesians 2, uh, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That word there's poema. I told you about this. We're an anthology of poems. I have my story. But my story doesn't overshadow or predominate or remove your story. You have your story. And we learn from one another. And you teach one another in this. But you know something? You've got to get together with one another. You'll greet one another with a holy kiss. We talked about that finishing up Corinthians. You'll wait for one another. Think preferentially. You'll have the same care for one another. You'll comfort one another. You'll agree with one another. You'll serve one another. You'll bear one another's burdens. You'll bear with one another in love. You'll be kind to one another. You'll forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. You show me a begrudging Christian, I'll show you a person who either has not been truly forgiven by Christ or doesn't understand the depth of it. You'll address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
You'll submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You'll teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. You'll increase and abound in love for one another. You'll encourage one another. You'll build one another up. You'll seek to do good to one another. You'll exhort one another every day. Every day. Wow, that's, that's really different from, it was great to see you today. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. You'll build one another up. Stir up one another to love and good works. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I told you last week, week before last. That's what Karen and I are trying to do, getting you into our homes. Hope that you'll do the same. You'll clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. you have fellowship with one another. And then, quickly, and I close, what you won't do what you, will, what you would rather put a dagger to is not pass judgment on one another. Not have lawsuits with one another. Not devour one another. Not consume one another. Not become conceited, provoking one another. Not envying one another. Not lying to one another. Not speaking evil against one another. Not grumbling against one another. Now, hopefully you see why it's going to take us a little while to get through this. But oh, brothers and sisters, join me in this study. Join me in this study. Work, work these verses into your own reading. Just reading and praying. Reading and praying. Say, dear God, when our pastor speaks on this, Give him unction, Lord. And as I've said to you, and I mean it, send me your thoughts. I'm willing for this to be an interactive sermon series. I don't mean we're going to sit here and talk to one another, but you, you, you reach out to me, okay? Just, you thought about this, thought about that. Why? Because that's how you, one of the ways you can show love toward me, regard toward me, one another. Are you with me in the journey? You see, if it's a command, I don't see how we have an option to say, well, you know, preach, that's all good stuff. But can't we study some theology? Well, this is a, this is a pretty good word about God, which is what theos logos is. <laughs> it's a word about God. Join me in this. Start praying. Dear God, how can I, how can I show love for others? in the church where you planted me? How can I stop treating it like, like it's a movie? Got the tickets, think I'll go see that feature. And recognize it's a body. Plug in, do, serve. What, what have I just read to you? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. This is our challenge. I challenge myself first. Never ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do, to give myself to. And my prayer is that wherever we go from here, that we'll be stunned, gloriously, wonderfully stunned by what God does with a community. It's like we want to be the, the Gaithers saying, let the church be the church. We want to be the church, not be a member of a church only. I'll leave you with this. When it comes to Bethel, ask yourself this question and then be willing to respond to it in this. If every member was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come and bow before you in Jesus' name. And just reading through this, Lord, read through this list. I'm convicted. I... Forgive us when we get weary. Forgive us when we, when we think we've done enough. Forgive us when we think we can go into retirement. For, forgive us of all these things that the enemy of our soul 
tries to sell to us to keep us from being a one anothering community. And Father, by your Spirit, help us to go to work on these things, to intensify the expression of these things, and then show us the truth of Jesus. When he said, The world will, will know that you're my disciples. And he says, Another place, the world will believe that God sent me when they see the love that my followers have for one another. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe upon us this day for the glory of God, for the exalting of the name of Jesus Christ, which, which is the overarching truth of this place for the good of the souls who make up this church and for the salvation of those around us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.